Hello and welcome to a very special mini-series in collaboration with Fly Flight Simulators Midlands based at Coventry Airport in Warwickshire, England. And in this series I'm going to be showing off some professional simulators that are available for both pilots and the general public to fly in, talking a little bit about each one and how they are set up. I'll be conducting an interview with Captain Chris Rigby, a pilot with decades of flying experience under his belt, I believe over 23,000 hours, and the owner of Fly FSM. And he will be taking me into a 737-800 and giving me the full experience. And we'll see just how much of my aviation knowledge, gained both in home simulators and university courses, helps me fly the aircraft. Finally, we'll be jumping back into the home simulator with X-Plane 11, and we will try to recreate the same flight, seeing if I have improved, by how much, and I will be talking about some of the key differences in flying a home sim to a full training sim. So, stay tuned over the next few videos to see that. So, getting to Coventry early in the morning, um, it was actually one of two visits. I, I visited this place twice and of course I'm going to take a picture of an aircraft taking off or landing. So in this case we've got an aircraft landing. It was really, really cold, grey, grey skies, typical England. You wouldn't get anything else. I mean, I was hoping that there would be nice blue skies to show off the airfield and things like that, but uh, that's not going to happen. So Warwickshire was very, very great. Uh, one of the pilots I actually met at RAF Cosford during my visit last September. And so I'd been planning this for a very long time. In fact, these videos have been planned for a very long time. But anyway, time to get inside and have a look around. Before getting any further, my first port of call on my first visit was to take a look at the simulators that were available. So before I decided to jump in and actually fly one with Chris, I wanted to see what was there. Currently at Fly FSM there are three simulators, the 747-400, the 737-800 and the Airbus A320. Now the 737-800 and the A320 are full motion simulators with collimated displays, I'll explain more on that later, whilst the 747 is a static sim with a wraparound projector screen. The reason for these differences is that the 737 and A320 can be used for professional training, whilst the 747 cannot, although it does provide enough realism to train in, as I saw when I took a look inside. Now without a doubt, the 747 is going to look the best in terms of visuals on this video. This is because of that wraparound screen that it has, ensuring almost 180 degrees field of view. However, the downside to this screen is that depending on where you are sitting, the screen would display a slightly off-center image. Now, it's not much, but it is enough for it not to be used in training, in the sense that if you're flying in a certain direction, one pilot might see it moving in one direction, whilst the other pilot sees it moving in another direction. So that's not exactly great for flight training, at least in the finer aspects. However, for entertainment, for taking videos, for getting to feel like you are flying a 747, as well as basic training, other training types were useful in this, it was perfect. And I believe that British Airways pilots used to use it before their interview process as a way to get a little extra experience with the aircraft systems, and I could certainly see why everything was there. Now this particular simulator was originally an Aer Lingus 747-200 simulator and it was a training simulator that had been refit with the new Dash 400 glass cockpit displays and the software. Now between my two visits to the airfield, the 747 had actually been swapped from prepared 3D to X-Plane 11 and I have to say that X-Plane 11 visually looks stunning in a full sim. That's not to say that Prepared 3D did not look great too, it, it really does look great, but X-Plane just stood out, at least in certain scenarios. Andy, the main engineer at Fly FSM, was kind enough to set up a few scenarios for some footage, and as you can see, whether we were flying over Seattle in the evening or bursting through some clouds, it looked amazing. And it really did feel like I was on the flight deck of the Queen of the Skies. It was also the first time I'd seen a 747 flight deck in many, many years, and it was immediately familiar to me. And of course, I did give it a bit of a flight, seeing just 
what it was capable of. Uh, one of the things I will say is that just like in a home sim, it's a lot high. You're a lot higher up than you think. So when you're landing the aircraft, yeah, your wheels are going to touch down quicker than you think, especially if you're used to something like a 737. So that was one big difference. Um, in fact, I think that difference is probably across any double-decker or any aircraft compared to the 747. You're just way higher up in the flight deck, and that was really noticeable in the sim. The A320 was rather busy the first time I went, but I managed to get some time in it on my second visit, and immediately I realised I would not be able to fly this without guidance. This is actually the most complete of the sims in terms of systems for professional training, and it's made sense that it would be this one, given that it was not originally a simulator, but a British Airways aircraft. Registration Golf Bravo Uniform Sierra Foxtrot, it was scrapped a few years ago and then back-engineered into a simulator mounted on a full-motion platform. I also found out that some of the flight instructors at Fly FSM actually flew this aircraft, which must have been interesting when getting into it for the first time after it had been converted to a simulator. Now, unlike the 747, this one had those previously mentioned collimated displays, which meant that unless you're looking at the screens from a pilot's view, they look a little bit distorted, as you're going to see on this video. However, for training accuracy, at least for two pilots, this was exactly what was required because you had high resolution imagery that was accurate from both seats, not seeming to point slightly in one direction or the other. So that is a requirement that has to be fulfilled and the A320 and the 737 both fulfill that requirement. I have to say though, the A320 felt a lot more spacious than either of the sims, the 737 or the uh, 747. And the 747 is so much bigger and the A320 just felt a lot more spacious. I think it's partly to do with the fact that there's no yoke and instead we have a side stick which I just called a joystick because that's what it looks like and that really opened up the space. In addition to that the controls look far simpler and generally um, if I compare it to the 737 which was the direct Boeing comparison it, it felt more welcoming for some reason. I can understand why some pilots prefer the A320. It just it seems more welcoming. Even the colours seemed more welcoming. Personally, I still don't like the aircraft, but it was very, very accurately represented in the sim. So when I sat in that aircraft, I felt like I was sitting in an A320. It was really, really accurate. And strangely comfortable. The 737, of course, was the one I was looking most forward to seeing. Given that that is the one aeroplane I choose to fly whenever I want to fly jets, due to it being a shorter range aircraft, smaller, I wanted to see just how accurate the Zebo 737 or the PMDG 737, both of which I have flown in, were in terms of layout, colours, displays, systems. Of course, afterwards I'd have a look at flight dynamics and things like that. And I have to say that PMDG and Zebo both do not disappoint whatsoever. But actually getting to look inside something that was as close to the real thing as I would get was definitely special. And even more so knowing that at some point I was going to try and fly this thing. Now already I could see how complicated the systems were. And to give you an idea as to the complexity, at home, X-Plane 11 runs on a single PC. Uh, my controls are connected to a single PC. The screen is off a single PC, and if I use head tracking, that's on a single PC. Everything is connected to one PC. These simulators were using three, four, even five computers to run them, all linked together. And all those PCs were specced pretty highly. I definitely spent most of my time in the 737 though. Uh, probably a little too much time, but I wanted to try everything and see how much of my knowledge worked here. Like both the other sims, the FMC works properly with the CDU, so that's the display, the co uh, control display unit that is between the two pilots, which is where you put all the information in for your flights, your uh, takeoff pages, your legs page, all that kind of stuff. That was working fine, took in all my inputs as I would expect it. The fire systems worked, the overhead panel was fully functional, I went through fire procedures, engine start procedures, the APU start procedures, terrain, uh, terrain radar worked, everything essentially worked, it just felt like the real aircraft, the radio systems worked, and 
Seeing what the yoke and rudder felt like, that was something that was quite special, going through its full range of motion. Now these things are taken off real aircraft, they're designed off actual aircraft components, it's not something you get on a consumer market. They felt way, way higher in quality. They felt industry standard, as you would expect, because they come from aircraft. Now, with that, I did notice that the yoke and the rudder were a lot heavier when it came to moving than I thought they would be. Of course, I'm used to my simulator at home, and at home, I've got a flight stick, like the Airbus, um, and I can move that left and right, and it's not, it doesn't have that much resistance. I added some extra resistance on it, but it's not that much resistance. The range of motion isn't great, and even on rudder pedals, you don't feel it in the same way as you would feel in the sim. So especially the rudder pedals, they were really, really heavy. And I suppose, I suppose it does make sense that the rudder pedals are going to be that heavy. And of course the ailerons as well. So the yoke is going to be heavy because you're moving a rudder. And a rudder is a big slab of metal. And the ailerons are huge control surfaces. So it would make sense naturally that they are going to be heavy, it's going to be difficult to move them. But until I stepped into this sim, that didn't that didn't click to me. Um, it was only after stepping into that sim and trying the controls that I thought, oh yeah, that's that takes a bit of effort. You do need to be fairly strong to fly an air uh, to fly an aeroplane. Now, what I was also impressed with though is that how a representation in X plane or prepared or flight simulator 10 made me feel immediately comfortable with this aircraft i found myself just wanting to set up a flight and going as i would be doing at home on the other hand this felt real and i suppose it felt real because it was real aside from what i was seeing out the window everything in front of me was real and that made it feel a little bit daunting now, having had a look at everything, and in some cases for far too long, the next step was, of course, the flight. But before that, it was time to interview the captain in charge, Chris Rigby. Okay, so this is Captain Chris Rigby, and uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Chris Rigby. I was very fortunate to get selected by uh, BIC BEA back in the 70s to do their training program at Hamble, near Southampton and I qualified from there, joined BOAC, but unfortunately there wasn't any work going for us there so I moved to a BEA subsidiary, uh, Cyprus Airways, and spent two years out in Cyprus before coming back and joining Britannia Airways at Birmingham Airport. Uh, fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time and I got an early command at the age of 27. Uh, from there I moved from Britannia and did some freelance work for a few years, different companies, and then I joined EasyJet at its startup in Luton. Uh, and from EasyJet I moved back to British Airways uh, on the Embraer 145 at City Express uh, and unfortunately when that operation closed down at Birmingham I moved back to Britannia but now rebranded as Thompson Fly out of Coventry Airport and I was acting fleet manager for the 737 fleet in Coventry. And finally uh, when that operation closed down I moved to Ryanair and did two and a half years with Ryanair and then retiring at the age of 60 a year later I decided to start a simulator business and here we are today with Flight Simulators Midlands. So Flight Simulators Midlands, so what is it and what, what do we have here and what made you think of actually starting this in the first place? Well a friend of mine called in one day for a coffee when I was at home and said uh, what are you doing and I said this that and the other and he said have you ever thought about the simulator business and I said no not really. Uh, he said well I, I know someone who does it and he said I think it would be right up your street. So. Three months later, we ended up with our first simulator, and uh, that was just coming up to eight years ago. A year later, we obtained uh, a second simulator, but the first one we bought was a 737. The second one was the Boeing 747, which was operated by Air Lingus originally. Uh, and then a year later, we bought the A320, uh, which is a real aircraft shell, and we back engineered that into a simulator. So we now have the three separate simulators of all different genres. So we're able to provide uh, entertainment and training for professional pilots on the different types of aircraft. We're based at Coventry Airport, uh, and we are the largest individual uh, simulator centre in the country, open and available to the public. Fantastic. So you were talking about, um, you know how you provide training and everything. So as a veteran pilot yourself, what was it like when you first started 
learning to fly airliners, you said in the 1970s, was it? Yes, that's right. Well, the technology was nothing like it is today. Uh, the first simulator I went on was a Trident simulator down at Heathrow, uh, and the visuals on that consisted of a model of a village uh, mounted on a wall with a moving camera. And as you flew the simulator, you flew in over the village and eventually hopefully found the runway. So it was very, very basic stuff. We used to try and specialise in knocking the church spire off if we could with the camera, which didn't please the engineers at all, uh, but it was quite a lot of fun. And then we progressed, of course, into simulators with electronic visuals, but they just represented the runway, usually at night, just with lighting and no other features. Today, of course, with the advent of gaming software, uh, and advanced uh, technologies for real simulators. Uh, the visuals today are amazing, even with vehicles running up and down the streets, other aircraft flying around, uh, even sometimes people walking around the terminals. So, I mean, you're talking about the differences in simulators and how they've progressed. So there's a lot of emphasis now, I think, on simulators for pilots to be practicing. Um, that, you said, it differs quite significantly to when you started out. Mm -hmm. So. You know, with that, does it make it safer? Do you think it, it makes it safer because pilots can do emergency procedures now using software such as, you know, P3D, X-Plane, etc., like engine fires or uh, emerge other types of emergencies on board? Do you think that naturally makes it safer to yeah, fly? Na naturally, the pilots are more exposed to a greater variety of possibilities. I mean, simulators have been around for a long time, of course. Um, and albeit that they weren't as sophisticated as they are today. The main difference really is in when I started, the simulator was a pre-training program, but you still had to actually go and fly the real aircraft, and you'd fly that round empty, uh, doing practice takeoff and landings. These days, simulators have progressed to such a level that you can actually do the simulator training and move from there straight onto an aircraft with passengers on board, albeit with a training crew with you and a monitoring pilot to make sure everything is going okay. So the training process is quicker in that sense um, and it's more practical. Uh, but also, as you say, uh, there's a great range of faults, etc., which can be uh, brought into uh, the program. What's uh, very interesting today is it's fairly proactive in, a, in as much that if there's an incident, uh, say, for instance, it happened on the Hudson River with the A320 ditching there, within a very short space of time, most companies in the world will be doing a practice ditching operation. In other words, taking real-life situations that have just happened, maybe with unusual circumstances around them, and actually be able to project that into the simulator scenario to give the crews the best option or best time to plan any such event that might occur to them in the future. So from that point of view, yes, simulators definitely have improved safety over the years. Yeah, so in, in essence, it's not just doing your, your standard emergency procedures, anything that happens in real life is now making its way back into the sim for training right, purposes. Correct, yeah. Right, yeah, okay. So then that moves us quite nicely on to home simulators because obviously we've been talking about the, the simulators you use as pilots, the simulators you have mm -hmm. here, but for those of us who have home simulators like myself, what do you feel about the experiences in them and do you think that in any which way they relate to real life. Um, for example, even for a pilot who may be, or someone who wants to potentially become a pilot mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. an engineer or something in the aviation industry, do you think that home simulators bring something to the table or what's your opinion of them? Oh, yes. I mean, I mean without doubt, if you're, if you're keen and enthusiastic and you want to learn about how aircraft operate, home simulators are a really good starting point. Um, what it doesn't give you, of course, is the ambience of the flight deck, uh, and it doesn't really quite create uh, the sort of scenarios and the, the feeling of reality which a real simulator can do. Um, but what we do find is that when we've got youngsters, I mean, we had one here just a week or so ago, he was only 10 years of age, but he flew the Airbus at home on his simulator, and he then flew our simulator absolutely perfectly, which is quite remarkable. But anything you do in life is a, a process. I mean, from driving a car to brushing your teeth. Basically, you, you look at the situation that you're in. If so we say you can't want to brush your teeth, you look where the toothbrush is, you tell your brain, or the brain tells your arm to pick it up and what to do with it, etc., etc. So it's a flow process. First of all, though, is the information 
where is the toothbrush, where do I reach for it? And so when you're flying an aircraft, the first process is what is the airplane doing? So if you can read the instrumentation and interpret that, then half the process is already completed. So you then need to work out what you're going to do to get the aircraft to do what you want it to do. And of course, if you're already quite expert at doing that, gathering that information, then it gives you a really good heads up. But I have to say, I, it would be a very expensive and very well built home simulator would perhaps replicate uh, the quality of the real machinery and we have real machinery in terms of thrust levers, control columns etc and unfortunately the replica stuff that's available on the market really doesn't make it look really right. You, you really need to get into a real machine to get that feel of authenticity. Right, so in essence this actually moves on quite nicely. You, you mostly answered the next question I had which was a customer that comes in here, we've talked about pilots training, mm -hmm. but for a customer that comes in here, a member of the public who wants a flight experience, it's that immersion in the sim that really brings that greater joy, that, that experience, that feel of flying, which is different, as you say, to, to a home sim. It's the fact you've got real controls, you've got uh, everything around you, physical controls, things like that. Yeah. So, you know, how, how, do you, how much more, do you, how important do you think that is to getting that flight feeling? Yeah, well, I think, I think you can compare it to, I'm sure most people have tried a driving simulator in an amusement arcade, uh, and yes, okay, it gives you the numbers, it does this, that and the other, but it doesn't really feel like the real thing. You've in a sense got to get in a real car uh, to get the real sensation of what's going on. Uh, a real flight simulator takes you as close as you possibly can get to the real aircraft. So it will generate your personal awareness of what's going on, uh, your body, your brain will react to being in that environment, and it's quite interesting what the brain does. Very often, if the brain doesn't see exactly what it's expecting to see, and what I'm really talking about here is computer-generated graphics. Uh, the computer-generated graphics, if you look at a building, you can see it is computer-generated. But when you're in a real environment of something like a simulator, the brain seems to fill in the dots in the, in the middle, as it were. So after a while, what you're seeing becomes real because everything else is real around you. So after a while you don't notice that they are dotted computer generated pillars, they actually almost become real in your mind. So the more you can replicate the real environment, the more that process will occur and therefore the whole thing becomes so much more realistic. And we have people who seriously get very excited in there, get very panicky and I usually shake the hand of the guest pile afterwards to see if their sweaty hands are not and about half are about sweaty so uh, you can take it that those people are really living the moment. Yes, that is actually amazing and I think I know a 737-800 fairly well from uh, in terms of layout at least mm -hmm. from my home simulation I haven't flown uh, I've only done a few hours recently in it, but I still know the layout and things like that. Uh, coming here, I've already had a, a look at your simulators a few times, and I know that some of, there are some key differences that I have going on, just in terms of what I'm looking at, not just the physical buttons, but just what I'm looking at mm -hmm. between the simulators, uh, between my simulator at home and this simulator yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other side, what I don't know is maybe key differences between the simulators you have here mm. and the real aircraft. So mm. could you maybe provide a little bit of insight mm. onto that difference? Yeah, well I mean a simulator could never ever totally replicate the real thing of course, um, but what simulators are used for today is really practicing procedures um, so that if you have an engine failure that you move the correct levers, take the correct course of actions. So that's the bit that you're really practicing in the simulator. But of course the more convincing you can make the environment, then the more uh, rea real the situation appears to be. Therefore, the more value of the practice the pilot's going to get. So, as long as the simulator can actually do all those functions in terms of uh, lights, systems failing, uh, warning systems, noises, etc., then they are you are replicating what you're going to find in the aircraft. And of course, in real life, you will probably never ever hear those on an aircraft in real life. I mean, in 40 years, uh, flying the 737, uh, I've never had a very serious incident at all. I mean, I've had a few problems with flaps, not going down, etc, etc. Never had an engine failure, engine fire, or hydraulic failure of any significance. So, the reality is you're practicing for something which, in reality, 
won't probably ever happen to you. So that's where the simulators come in, that every six months you're just rehearsing, going through different scenarios. So should it happen to you, then it doesn't come as a great surprise. Right, so in, in reality then it's like most of the systems on the simulator would be almost perfectly accurate to the real yeah. life. I remember you mentioning something about uh, weight, uh, for example, on the rudder, how the, the 737 simulators, uh, the rudder pedals are not as heavy as, for example, the, the real 737. You said it's about, is it half the weight or something? Yes, we, we, we make some compromises, should we say, for the, for the public because it's actually quite hard, quite difficult. You have to be trained to fly an airplane properly. So to take somebody, should we say, to have them bought a gift and coming straight off the street and to have a go, sometimes that's just a little bit more than they can handle. So we, we soften the system down a little bit so that basically they can cope with it and it makes more sense to them. Uh, we can firm it up for the real training, so that's not a problem when we have professional pilots in to do their training. Um, but we, we, we vary it just very slightly so that the individual can cope with it. I mean, there's no point in somebody coming here and making a total mess of it to some extent that they're really disappointed in what they've done. We want them to have a good experience and the fact that maybe one control is slightly lighter than another is, is really neither here nor there. Yeah, because it's just it's making the ease of use for someone who's not yes, used to this sort of thing. Exactly. Which that makes complete sense. And lastly, would you say that the experiences that you, you provide here uh, at Fly FSM do they really give that the customer that comes in? Do they really come out of your simulators thinking, you know, what we've actually achieved something quite amazing? Oh, I think uh, so. You know, yeah, I think you only got to read our TripAdvisor reviews to see that we've got approaching a thousand five-star reviews. We've had the certificate of excellence from TripAdvisor for the last four years running, and I would hope we'd get 2019 fairly shortly. So I think the evidence is there on the table. Yes, and. Uh, Again, just read those reviews and you can see what a realistic, wonderful time most people have had uh, flying with us. So we're very pleased to have them here. Fantastic. Well, there you have it. Captain Chris Rigby of Fly FSM. Thank you. Next time in Simulation to Reality, I get inside the 737-800 with Chris and finally get a chance to see what it feels like to fly in a training sim under his guidance. Hopefully my limited sim experience, university degree knowledge and quick reads of flight handbooks would come in handy.